Hello everyone. Hello everyone, <laughs> sorry. There was a funny sound there and I thought it was coming from this, but I'm pretty sure it's a plane in the sky. It was just so loud. I was like, oh, is there feedback? No, <laughs> I'm losing my marbles. Okay, as you may or may not be able to notice, things look a little bit different today. Um, so I'm gonna attempt to fix that a little bit right now. Oh, right, here we go. This might help. Um, that direction. So, <laughs> there's a lot going on around here. Sorry if I see, seem distracted, I am here with you. Uh, but here's what's happening today. My HDMI cable just broke today with no time to go get a new one. And my backup solution didn't work the way I was expecting. So this is what we have. So here's what I need from you live. <laughs> Those of you who are watching live right now, can you let me know if my voice and my the visual are not in sync? And if you can tell, tell me whether the audio is ahead of the video or the video is ahead of the audio, or if it looks fine, that's okay. I've tried to sync them up, but it was very last minute. So I've done my best. <laughs> you can let me know. And it does also mean that we're gonna just be like this. We're gonna stay like this. If you normally come along to the show, this is different to what you're used to. There's gonna be no little intro bits, no little bits and pieces. It's just gonna be me and you chatting like this hopefully with the audio and video in sync. That's our aim for today. <laughs> Look okay and speaking looks fine. Okay, cool. Okay, perfect. Okay, so I guessed it right. Because <laughs> I had to, at the last minute, put in a mic delay because the video is not in real time as I'm looking at it. So that's all good. Okay, so... My hands are a bit blurred like a superhero. Yeah, that is to do with the resolution of coming through a USB cable. Can't be helped. Can't do anything about that. I'll try to talk with my hands less than I've been doing. Yeah, that's not fun to look at. I'll stop. Maybe I'll just stand like a superhero instead. Okay, so we're still going to talk about what we're going to talk about. We'll still go through the usual things we do. And I'm still happy to take any of your questions throughout today. But it is going to be just you and I hanging out. Not that there's usually other people here. Usually there's bits and pieces and intros and stamps and stuff, and that's not happening. Okay? <laughs> so that is the story <laughs> over here. Technology, hey? We roll with it. We roll with it. I'm sure many of you have learned that from, um, from teaching online these days. So if anyone comes in and they're like, "Where's the? what's going on? Why do things look different? If you can fill them in in the chat, that would be wonderful. Other than that, I'd love to hear from you. Let me know how you're doing. How are things going where you are? What's the news? What's going on for you in your teaching world this week? We've got lots of people joining live. Lee is here and Rachel and Karen. Hi, Karen. And Angie and Caleb. Krista and Susan. Oh my gosh. And Emmy. Hi, Emmy. And April was first into the room. <laughs> awesome. Lee, that's so cool. Proud to say they got some stacks of paper on the countertops cleared this weekend. Oh, I have my own binder. Oh, I feel so touched. That's lovely. <laughs> okay, so um, our main topic of today is about student milestones. And I'm going to try and share some milestones that maybe you wouldn't always consider to be milestones. And I'd love to hear what milestones stand out for you. So what I mean by milestones is... What are the moments in a student's journey, the things they can do, the skill acquisition or whatever, that make you say, oh, getting somewhere? Or those moments that you email the parents about and say, they did this today. Or you tell your husband or your wife or your dog or your cat or your children, this student did this. It was a huge deal, right? Not the obvious ones, maybe, but the ones that us teachers feel. Those are the ones I'd love to hear about. And I'd love to hear your news, as I said. So I have been in full-on scale mode this week. And I have to say, I have a challenge for you. <laughs> Especially if you're a VMT member. If you're a member, I want you to try playing along with the slowest scale sync track. Especially like a version of minors that you're less comfortable with. So many of us either did naturals or harmonics or melodics as our first choice. 
That's most of us, right? And we know the other ones, of course. I know all of them. But harmonics are the most instinctive for me. Naturals come second and melodics are a bit like, uh oh. When they came up on the exam, I would have gone, oh, really? Anyway, so I was doing melodics the last week. And like I say, of course I know the scales. But my challenge to you is play along with the slowest track of the one you're least comfortable with. It's even challenging when you do it with the ones you're most comfortable with because you have so much time to second guess whether you're right or wrong. So this is maybe something you won't have time to do, but if you do want an extra challenge, I'd love to hear your feedback about playing along with when the melodics come out them or the harmonics are out tomorrow. You could do those. You could do the naturals. You could do the majors. Play along with the 60 BPM. It's crotchets or quarter notes at 60 BPM, so it's slow, of like the full circle of fourths or full circle of fifths track from Scale Sync. Or if you're not a member, just play all of your scales around the circle of fifths with a bar or a measure between them at 60 BPM. And see if you can keep going the entire time. It's so slow and it is so much harder than just playing scales regularly, right? It's so much harder than playing at like 200. <laughs> and the reason I'm challenging you to do that is because I think it'll give you empathy with your students. When they say things are harder because they're slower, not just scales, because sometimes those are easier, slower if you don't know them, but pieces, exercises they're doing. And you ask them to say, to slow down and they say, oh, it's so hard. And a little piece of you maybe says, it's not hard, you just don't like it. Like, just do it <laughs> when you're feeling impatient. But it is harder. In many cases, it is harder. And that's why it's valuable. And understanding that as a teacher, I think, is really useful. So, yeah, that's a little side challenge for you today. But I'd love to hear what you've been working on. I've been doing all those scale recordings. So I've been practicing my melodic minors like a good student. <laughs> as I record those videos and those will be coming out in April so the harmonic set is coming out tomorrow and I'd love to hear members flamingos who are live your experience with the scale sync tracks so far because I just love these I think they're amazing I think they're just the best thing that's happened to scales in my teaching career is that a too big a statement I don't think it is they really make it so much more enjoyable to work on them so I'd love to hear your experience with that. And welcome, Shay. Yes, welcome. And Emily, also your first time. And Stephanie, I didn't say hello to you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So for those who are new, normally I have a few more things going on on this show, actually. It's a split up. But for today, we're having some camera issues. So it's just me and you like this. We're staying like this and we're going to have a lovely chat. I hope all together as we do every week. Um... So other things that are going on in our sphere, we had uh, a wonderful um, article and podcast episode come out today. I'd highly encourage you to check that out. It's called Sampling Salsa Through Piano Improvisation. And the author, Rachel, oh my gosh, just the approach to creating improv with this mild, medium and spicy format. I think you could apply it to so much stuff, but it's a great approach for salsa in particular. It's so creative. And then there's a podcast episode where I riff on that idea as well. So you can check out both of those. And we had a YouTube video release, which was um, one of our edited versions of a live chat like this, which is about comparing yourself to others and believing in yourself, I guess. And it's had a really good response in the comments, some great stories shared already. So I'd love your thoughts there if you watch it or if you watch the live and you want to chime in with what you thought about the topic as well. And then biggest news, we have a brand new course out for Flamingos for members. It's called Arrange Again Repeat. So I'd love to hear your experience with arranging with your students. Do you do that already? Is that something you include in your studio? I know it's something that I haven't been as strong on in the past, but it's really, really valuable for many students who 
even the ones who don't think they want to arrange their own music, if they're interested in things that generally don't have great piano arrangements, get them into arranging it themselves. We're actually doing an arranging project in my studio alongside us releasing this course where I'm getting every student to learn a bit of a Irish folk song or like a, a trad song, a traditional song. Um, and most of them aren't songs, I should say, piece. They're mostly like standard trad tunes that would be played for Irish dancing. And so every student is learning a bit or a whole one of these and they're going to create their own arrangement of it. So it's my way of connecting them to that music, even though they're not in the trad music world. And that really is quite separate here from classical music, from jazz, like it's all segmented off. But I want to give them a taste of that. And so I think it's a great way to do that. You could have students explore a piece from their parents' background or from a country that interests them or your country if you're from somewhere else and you're teaching, you know, not in your the country you were born in. Maybe that's an interesting angle to get them to all explore the music from where you grew up. Uh, I think there's so many ways you could go with that in terms of world music. And it could also be like a pop project. So this course is a little bit different in that it's a very loose framework so that you can fill in the blanks. So it's to give you the structure so that you can use it for any arranging project you want to do with your students. I hope you enjoy it. It came out last Friday, so maybe some members might have already tasted it a little bit. I know I've already had some comments back um, that people were enjoying it. Um, and yeah, today we're going to talk about this idea of milestones. So let's dive into that. When I think about student milestones, or when I thought about this topic, I was trying to come up with ones that you might not think of and that might not be as obvious to parents. So that's my goal. And I'm going to go through them in order from sort of the beginning through, although some of them are very movable and I'll explain those as we get to them. But I'd love to hear your milestones. What are the moments with a student's journey that you say, aha, they got it. Like, this is the thing. So what I'm not covering here is, yeah, the standards, like they finished a book, they played a C scale. I'm also not covering the things that we need to keep teaching. So I don't consider um, having a consistent practice habit to be a milestone because that could just as easily disappear and you'll have to teach it again or like piano posture. That's going to change because they're going to grow and they're going to forget or alter things or whatever. So those are not milestones to me. But some things, you hit it and that's it. They've got it and it's very unlikely to become unstuck or it's just a finite thing that has happened now. So that is what we're aiming for. So my first one on my list, and I'd love to hear yours, is marching with a steady beat. How many would of you would have thought of that as a milestone? For some students, it is not because they come to us already able to do that. And that's great and more power to them, right? So that's not really a milestone for them. But for those who don't, either because they start with you young, they're preschoolers, etc., or because they just struggle with that beyond that preschool, early, early childhood kind of age, they can't keep a pulse. Like they can't go in time with music at all, marching or tapping or whatever action you want to have them do. Clapping is harder, by the way. So I'm not really thinking about clapping here. But if they're tapping on their legs or marching in time, can they do that with a steady beat? Have you thought about that as being a milestone before? Because I think for many students, that's one of the first ones. And it's one that parents will not know is a thing. But if you email them and you say, oh my gosh, today, Johnny got it. He was in time with the beat and I played different speeds of music and he was right in time and he hasn't done that before. It's such a key, important factor in development for music. The parent's going to be over the moon and they're going to know to give Johnny the big high five and you know, give him the congratulations he deserves or just just take that moment to celebrate where he is on his musical journey. So it's those kinds of moments that we're looking for today. 
So that's my first one. Love to hear your first one. Marching or tapping with a steady beat, because many students come to me not being able to do that. My next one is recognizing intervals up to a fifth. Now I've chosen not to put in any note naming ones here because I think that's more something that can get undone as I talked about before. Like we're not thinking about milestones as things that can backslide that you have to keep reinforcing forever. But for me, once students say pass the interval challenge, which means they've um, the interval challenge is a flashcard challenge in VMT and in my studio, and that's where they are naming all of the intervals and playing them on the piano. And if they pass that first level of the challenge, they understand intervals up to a fifth. They can recognize them. And that doesn't really go away. I'm not saying they can play with them fluently all the time, but when students can successfully do that, I think that's a big milestone because they're starting to really get the patterns in the music. Right? Let me know what you think of that as a milestone marker. And there's definitely one that parents wouldn't be aware of, right? If they don't play music, even if they do play music, because they probably learnt with mnemonics or something. The next one, number three for me, is playing hands together. And by this, I mean actually coordinating two hands in some way. So playing chords in one hand and, you know, a melody in the other hand or playing in unison or playing even contrary motion, those kinds of things. The first time they play a piece that is hands together, I think is a big one. And I think it's one that parents often can see, do get, especially if you point it out, they're going to immediately just recognize like, oh yes, that does seem harder, right? It just instinctively, even to a non-musician, feels harder than playing with one hand at a time. Like they get how they would have trouble with that, don't you think? So I think for many, that's that's something that stands out to them. Milestone number four is one you may have thought of. Their first performance. So this is one that's movable. Maybe this comes right at the start. Maybe it comes way later. It kind of depends on timing, right? But um, their first performance is a really big one. And if you don't do recitals in or concerts or anything like that in your studio where you just don't want that focus their first performance could mean the first time they play for their aunt at home okay I'm not saying it has to be a concert but for many students it is that first time that they get up in public and play for others as a performance do you remember your first performance I don't remember my exact one but I know that it was late, so I feel like I should remember it because I was probably 12, 13, no, older. I'd say 14 or 15 because it was the last studio I was at. So I had two teachers before that, but they didn't do concerts or recitals. So I did exams, but not any kind of performance. And I wouldn't have played for my family at home because I was just painfully, um, not even shy, just... <laughs> not wanting to be the center of attention, never. So <laughs> funny we're running a YouTube show when that's your personality. Anyway, but I think I was probably 14 or 15, but I don't remember the actual first one. I just remember that that was the new thing in that studio. So I'd love to hear about your first performance. Um, but I think for many students, it is a really big deal. And it is one that parents can instantly say, oh my gosh, like that's the moment. And those are those moments when a parent who, you know, whose kid also plays football or even does gymnastics or karate, there's so many more occasions in most things to get up and cheer for your child, right? And piano or learning music is so much more a solitary week by week, day by day activity that just keeps going and there are all these little wins all the along the way but they're so much harder to see and so we need to help parents see them and for you to help parents see them you need to see them yourself but that first performance is one that even parents can see and can, hopefully they celebrate I actually at the start of every concert I like to point out to parents that they would be terrified to get up here because I think just putting them in that frame of mind is really important 
this is a bit of a tangent, but this is a tangent kind of day. <laughs> so it reminds me of, there's a study where they showed people, they were trying to improve rates of people signing up for a pension when they signed up for a new job. So you could sign up for automatic pension contributions when you started your new job and you could opt in or out. And they increased the sign-up rates simply by showing people a computer-generated image of themselves when they were 70. And just showing them that increased the rates at which people signed up for a pension. Meaning, focusing on your future self was what made them say, oh, hang on, I do want to actually have money when I'm older. <laughs> so, this is why that reminds me of that, is... is at the start of these concerts, I say to parents, I know most of you would be terrified to get up here. You would find this really intimidating. And it's not any easier for students. It is huge. And the confidence that they build by doing this is enormous. So let's all appreciate that. Let's all pay attention to them the whole time, you know. So that's the frame of mind I want parents to be in going to it, going into it. Put yourself in their shoes. Acknowledge that you would not do this and your seven-year-old child, your 13-year-old child, even harder, is doing it. And they deserve huge high fives for that. Don't you think? Um, the next one, milestone number five for me, I don't necessarily have to be in this order, of course, is the first student choice book. Would you have picked that out as a milestone? The first time the student gets to choose their own book. So I'm not saying I impose all books on students, but to a certain extent, especially with younger students, you're going to pick their first books, like their method books and even some of their first supplement books, if you have a specific need. Um, but there is that point where they get to pick their own book. And for me, it's usually some way in the middle of a lef level two method book, when I feel the student is ready to handle another book into the mix. Their reading is strong enough or perhaps to address a reading deficit. It all de depends on the situation. I ask them to choose between a selection of books. And that's a big moment. And I try to make sure they understand that too, the student. This is your chance to pick your own book. I want you to listen to them. I want you to start to teach me about what you love. And teach yourself about what you love. I love that moment when I get to give them that choice. And for some students, it just passes over their head. But I try to emphasize it. And for others, they immediately get it. Like their eyes go wide. Like this is my moment. This is when I get to choose my own thing. Have my own identity, right? It's huge. I love that moment for students. Milestone number six for me that I picked out was the first time a student plays a beautifully shaped phrase. Can you remember one of those with one of your students? I certainly can for many of mine. That first time they did proper phrasing. They properly played this, this piece of music, really like it was music, right? They shaped that phrase, they made it sing. That is such a magical moment as a teacher. I'm sure you'll agree with that. And one we don't often pick out and acknowledge to parents, do we? But it's super powerful, and it's one they won't pick up on. But they might actually... No, I mean, if you bring it to their attention, they might be able to appreciate it. If you point out that now it sounds like X, Y, Z with this piece, they might be able to actually understand what that means when you explain it to them. Or you could even have them come in. So say, oh, could you come in five minutes for five minutes at the start of the lesson? Or can you come in five minutes early, like call them in from the car if they just wait outside and say, okay, I want you to really listen to this. This is the first time um, Sadie has played this beautiful shaped phrase like this. Listen to how much more musical it sounds. Number seven, milestone number seven is that first piece they truly, deeply fall in love with. 
can you remember yours? Because I can remember mine. I was not enthusiastic about many of my pieces <laughs> initially, but even with students who are, even if it's students who do really like a lot of their pieces, there's still that first piece that is a little bit further in to their studies that, oh my gosh, they're in love with it. Like it, it just lights them up. Can you remember that one for you? For me, it's actually an early-ish piece, but I was... I moved pretty slowly in the beginning years, so I think I was about two years in. It's called Gummy Bear Boogie. And the Gummy Bear Boogie, I mean, it was the first thing that I just loved. And then I loved everything in that book. It was great. But um, that was the first piece that, like, I went home really enthusiastic to practice it. Like, I played it properly. I felt like it was real music. Um, I think if it weren't for that book, I don't think we'd be talking today at all. Because outside of, outside of that, I just had John Thompson. And my teacher obviously tried this book randomly on me. I don't think I picked it or anything. Um, and I fell in love with it. And then I moved teachers and I really fell in love with piano from there. But would I have moved teachers if I hadn't had that book? I'm not sure. I'm not exactly sure. Right? <laughs> Angie said theme from ice castles. I'd say that's a common one, actually. I feel like I hear that quite a lot as a, a first love piece. I'd love to hear yours too. My milestone number eight, though, is what I'm calling independent dynamics. So this is, what I mean by this is dynamics that the student has either chosen or interpreted in some way from their piece that you did not ask for at all. Like, you didn't even say, oh, can you focus on the dynamics? They just chose to add them. That's a magical moment, right? Because they want the piece to come to life. They want to add their own stamp to it, to interpret it in a certain way. Can you remember one of those moments with your students? I know I can. And it's a big one. Because initially, there's a lot of teachers who are just... You know, we feel like we're beating them over the head with the dynamics, right? No, dynamics, 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 circling them, highlighting them, all that kind of stuff. And then there's that moment where they bring back a piece and they've added their own stamp to it, maybe even without really realizing that's what they were doing. That's a big moment. And again, another one to point out to parents, because they won't realize that's what happened, that you didn't instruct them in that. Milestone number nine, I've got three left. The next one I came up with was legato pedaling. Feels like a weird one to pick out, but some of these just stand out to me as, as this transformative moment for students. So when they really master legato pedaling, when you really get it and you can do it, you know, accurately, I don't think you lose that knack. I think it's a little bit like driving... I just realized I'm talking to a lot of Americans, right? So a lot of you don't drive stick. But when we learn to drive, we use a clutch. <laughs> Everyone, like, that's how you take a driving test. There's no, you don't get to take an automatic driving test. No, that's another thing. So when you get that knack of finding the biting point on the clutch and then, you know, accelerating and changing gears and all of that, when you get it, you don't lose it. I actually drive an automatic now because it's a hybrid and I can still drive a stick. <laughs> you don't lose that knack. So I think legato pedaling is like that. And I also think it's transformative because so much music and especially so much of the music that students love to play. And let's be honest, that's not always Baroque music or classical. It's often the romantic and it's often the modern and the contemporary. And so much of that needs good legato pedaling technique. That's what it needs. And so when they master that, and they really master it, and they can use it to like fudge over mistakes when they're sight reading, as I am guilty of, then I think that's a big moment for them. Let me know if you agree or if you're like, eh, no, that's, that's not a milestone. That doesn't matter. I've got two left. My next one is Alberti bass. And given what I just said about like old fashioned music or 
students preferring contemporary, you might think this is an odd choice. But the first time a student plays or gets used to Alberti bass or a pattern similar to that, that's just mostly the one that comes up first, that is really a lot of independent left-right stuff going on. I think that's a big moment too, because they start to not lock their hands in shapes, but to, you know, use rotation more freely. I mean, even if they've been taught it before then, that's when they really get it and its usefulness. And they start to build up these patterns and understand how chords break down. And then the other left-hand patterns that come after that are really a continuation. Um, And the ones that come before it are usually quite simple. So that first piece with Alberti bass, I think, is a huge one, and definitely one non-musicians won't pick up on. And my last one is probably my favourite. This is the one that when it happens in a lesson, I feel like I automatically sit back in my chair, stop typing or analysing or planning. I sit back in my chair and I truly feel in the moment and listen to the student, just listen to them. And I know maybe I should do that more often, but this is the one that forces me into that, that makes me sit back and really appreciate what they've done and how long we've been working together and how much practice they have put in to get to this point. And that one is when the right hand sings out properly over the left, usually the right hand, it could be the other way around, but basically getting that hand balance when You can make one hand louder than the other, make it sing out over the other hand. That's a huge moment for me. Because that's when a lot of their music really starts to go to a new level. I feel like this should happen earlier with students, but when I was at our exam centre a long time ago now for a workshop, there was the um, Pathétique Sonata second movement of the Pathétique on the syllabus for grade six at that time. And he mentioned that it was perfectly acceptable for the students to play it like all kind of even. Um, that if it was at a later grade, you would be expecting this, right? The singing out nature. And I don't know about you, but the pathetic second movement of the pathetic without, without voicing, without properly I mean, no, it's nothing, but with it, magic, right? Even if you're a bit sick of it, maybe, but it's one of my favourites and that is one of my big dream pieces that I learned as a student was the first movement. So it has a special place for me, but I think playing it all, you know, unbalanced or... Maybe that is more balanced. <laughs> the other way, the way I want is unbalanced, if we really think about it. But not properly balancing the sound is what I mean. It's nothing. Don't you agree? Yes. Angie, it has to sing. It has to. And you that is one where when students are first learning this technique, say I'm teaching it to them through a technique exercise book. I don't always do that. But for some, we do work on it through specific exercises. And when I'm doing that and they're a little bit reluctant or a bit meh about working on this skill, I play just a little bit of that both ways. And I'm like, tell me the second one didn't sound 1000 times better and it's not worth it. They can't. I mean, anyone can hear that difference. That is night and day. And it's a popular piece as well. So it sells the point. You can steal steal that technique if you <laughs> want to convince your students about working on singing out the right hand. I'd love to hear actually how you were taught it because I like to be quite explicit with technique things with my students and I do use some metaphors and flowery language but I always like to also ground it in here's what you're physically doing. But when I was taught pieces like that and told to sing out with the right hand I was told just to listen for it more and that kind of language does nothing for me. I, I'm quite a technical person, maybe to a fault, but I like to know the physical things that are happening or like, I'm quite mathematically minded. I'm no maths whiz, but you know what I mean. And so I prefer to think of things like that. So that's just a side note to encourage you to always talk about it both ways. Because for some students saying, 
oh, imagine your right hand is a singer and they would sing out over this. For some of them, great, that's exactly what they need. For others like me, they need specifics of what are we doing? And for others, they need both. So I think just give everyone both explanations. <laughs> Those are my 11 uh, milestones. I'll go through them briefly again as a summary. So we started with marching with a steady beat for those students who come to you without that skill. The next milestone was recognizing intervals up to a, a fifth reliably. The next milestone was playing hands together, you know, in a blocky sort of way or playing in unison, that kind of thing. The next one was the first performance, whatever form that takes. Then we had the first student choice book, the first book, supplemental book usually, that students get to choose from different genres of music and put their own stamp on what they're learning. Then we had the beautifully shaped phrase that students often get to, like in a level two as well. The first piece they truly deeply fall in love with. I'll say for my students, the most common one recently has been A Wistful Daydream from the middle of Piano Safari 2. That's the first one for many of them that just gets them to go. I want to sound like that. Like, this is what I want to sound like. Then we have the independent dynamics, meaning they go away and apply them independently and just come back to you and they have added their own dynamics or applied what the composer intended without you reminding or cajoling. Then we have the legato pedaling technique and doing that on autopilot. And then Alberti bass, just as a marker for hand independence, really. And then finally, that singing right hand that we need so desperately for the pathetique and for so many other things. Um, Angie said, I emphasize tops, dropping into the top middle finger, depending on where the melody is. I teach it by having them hum the melody line, by playing the melody line by itself, shushing the middle fingers. Yes, great list of strategies uh, there, Angie. I do all of those absolutely as well. Um, I saw a couple of questions, so I'm going to come back to those. Lee, at what age or level do you let students help choose their recital piece? Okay, so that's an interesting one. That actually depends on the recital for me, Lee, more than the student's level. So going into a concert, it depends on our prep time and the slant of the concert. But if we're going into... So for some concerts, I will be choosing for them because like it's a Christmas concert, for example, and I need everyone not to play the same piece. So sometimes if we're doing like a big Christmas concert or two relatively large Christmas concerts, I just choose um, because otherwise everyone's going to play Jingle Bells. That's just the result. And Silent Night. Everyone played Silent Night last year, but it wasn't a problem with the way we were formatting the concert. So... Yeah, so if it's something like that, I just choose. And if it's something like our end of year concert, we normally choose together and that doesn't that doesn't matter what level the student is at or what age they are. We go through their recent pieces and I help them to choose something that they love. So we're never actually, not never, but most concerts we do, are a piece you already know and repolishing it to celebrate what you're learning already. It's not a specific piece you learn for this thing, right? Hope that helps, but uh, many different approaches to recitals. There's another question, I'm just gonna, whoops. Question does not have a Y in it. There we go. Um, oh, Angie. I just booked a venue for an in-person recital. You once mentioned using pom-poms for support. Would you please speak to that? Some students are terrified about performing live versus video. Yeah, we're going to get a lot more performance anxiety for those, I think, for those coming back to it after having only video. So great thought. So pom-poms is our little tradition here at Colorful Keys. We've done that for every recital, even the online ones that I did, hoping to do in person this year, fingers crossed for me, but um, the online ones that I did, I hung up all the pom-poms at the back here because I ran it from this office 
I hung up all the pom poms as like streamer, not streamers, like uh, bunting, except they were pom poms. And then I held them and waved in the camera's face and all that. Um, but in person, the way I do it is I put a box of them at the door and I have a sign up that says, please take one, like one per person. So they just have one. And I have them practice at the start. So when I do my welcome speech, I say to them, okay, after each performer, we're going to wave our pom-poms. So let's practice now together, cheering and waving the pom-poms so they know what's expected. Because many parents will go into that situation expecting it to be a more formal applause, like they know something about stuffy classical music. And that's not what I want. It's a kid's concert. So I like to have them whoop and wave the pom-poms. So we do a little pantomime like test of that at the start and then they're just supposed to do that after each student so if a student plays more than one piece I don't do applause in between I just like if the reason a student does more than one piece is because their pieces are like 30 seconds right so I just ignore the fact that there should be a applause after each one so we pull out after each student while they bow and that's when we wave the pom-poms in the air and it's really fun. I think it just makes it more colourful, more fun, in some ways more inclusive because it's not all this loud applause which might be upsetting for some students with ASD and that kind of thing. It's also, yeah, it's a hearing impaired option. Not that you necessarily need to cover that, but it does make it more inclusive in that way. So that's pretty much how I do it. So I just bought a big, big thing of pom-poms and I keep them and they're the colours of the rainbow. So it like all colorful and fun the other thing I do which you don't have to accompany that with but I go around then at the start of the concert as well and I go to specific students who I think can be trusted so mostly like my teens and tweens I go to them and I give them a rhythm instrument so we can have some more different noises and like so I give out egg shakers and um maracas and that kind of thing that they can easily shake with one hand so I just dot those around the audience as a little strategic making it more vibrant <laughs> yeah I just use that word naturally that's not me trying to drop my brand name in <laughs> it's just I like things to be vibrant as you may have guessed um so yeah that's pom-poms any other questions let me know love to hear as well if any of you are reading along with our book so I was reading chapter five today so it'll be chapter six for next week if you're following along and chapter five was was lovely I didn't have a lot of like thoughts or comments about it as you'll see in the forums if you go in there it was just lovely it was lovely to read the stories so our book is teaching piano to students with special needs and it has been a wonderful read so far and a lot of more practical stuff but this chapter was really her own the author's own stories about particular students she'd had she changed their names of course and just told you the story of what the music did for them i would say to those reading along but who didn't get to chapter five by today or if you're going to read the book just be aware going into chapter five that you're not going to want to be in a like delicate mood <laughs> because I know friends of mine I don't really cry at many things ever except being put in the spotlight sometimes but not books and films and stuff I just am not that way inclined but I know friends of mine who do and they would have been weeping in this chapter which might be quite unexpected in a non-fiction book but there's beautiful stories and some quite sad moments as well about her work with with students uh, as a music therapist and as a teacher for uh, a piano teacher for specializing in students with special needs so if you read along let me know if you enjoyed it as much i just loved reading the stories i think for many teachers this will be one of the most powerful chapters for them I think it's a beautiful little book. It's well worth reading. So again, it's called Teaching Piano to Students with Special Needs. Pretty simple title, pretty on the nose. And it's about exactly what it sounds like it's about. So it's a great little book and it is a short read. That's why I keep saying little. Not little in impact, just in words, which is exactly what I want. I don't like waffle. <laughs> 
So, yeah. Those are my milestones. And those are my thoughts on the book. Next week on the show, I'm going to have my camera back to normal. And we are going to be talking about... Well, the the title is A Better Word for Sight Reading. So I'll give you a little preview, which is that I have transformed or changed the way I talk about sight reading for the most part to talk about discovery playing. So that's what I'm talking about when I say a better word for sight reading. So I'm going to be unpacking why I think that's a better word, what difference that can make. Like it's not just about words and nitpicking over things. I really think it makes a difference to how you see sight reading and how your students can see it as well. So we're going to be talking about that as well as strategies for teaching sight reading or discovery playing in general and how you can find joy in it. So I hope you'll join me back here for that show. In the meantime, I hope you have a absolutely wonderful week. Thank you so much for joining me and I'll see you next time.